Sure. Welcome, everybody. Great Salt Lake Institute is proud to present another Salty Science series. Um, we're hoping to help people get through COVID by entertaining you with jokes and songs and science. Tonight, we're featuring a Great Salt Lake song that Jamie and I co-wrote with one of our former students. Um, but mostly, we're here to talk about salty plants, smarty plants, Jamie called them. Um, so I'm really excited to um, turn it over in a minute to Jamie to introduce our speakers. But first, I just want to remind everybody, in case you want to go back and look at some of the other sessions um, that we have presented in the past. The first thing we focused on were humans and sociology of the lake and also water diversions and climate change and human impact on Great Salt Lake. Um, and next we went to the birds where we talked about shorebirds and pelagic birds and these special pelican uh, breeding colony that's on Gunnison Island. So that one was really fun. Um, then we went to the reptiles of Antelope Island and we also talked about morabolite, um, this mineral that's forming at Great Salt Lake now since the lake is so low, uh, we're getting these terraced mounds, which is really awesome. Um, but an indicator of the lake level. Um, and also we talked about mercury and the mercury problem in Great Salt Lake. Next week, we're going to go um, to Mars. Uh, we're going to Great Salt Lake, but you might think it's Mars. So we're gonna talk about some uh, unusual uh, extreme environments around Great Salt Lake and the life that lives there and why that might tell us about life in other places in the universe potential life. We don't know about life in other places in the universe yet. So we'll have a little astrobiology, um, microbiology session next Thursday, and that should be really fun too. So tonight, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie. I have to remember what to do. Um, it was a long break. <laughs> I don't remember how to work my computer, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh my goodness. So uh, just really logistical parts of things here. Um, um, there are two ways to um, interact with us. Um, one is through the Q&A box. Um, this Q&A box is where we're going to um, kind of store all of the questions throughout these three panelist talks. Um, the cool thing is, is you can upvote any of the questions. So if we know you're wondering the same thing, we can come back to that. And then um, I noticed, you know, people are using the chat box a lot to make comments. Please keep doing that. That's um, really cool. Um, um, you can see all of these recordings in on our Great Salt Lake Institute YouTube channel. Um, I like to use these playlists in case I need to correct things. Um, so there's um, a Salty Science series playlist, and there's also a Salty Science seminar short author talk list. So all of the talks are broken up into the, the 15 minute talks. Um, I really want to highlight, um, I mean, of course, tonight we have this rock star group of plant nerds um, and education nerds, but January 28th is the Am I on Mars or Great Salt Lake. Um, what's really cool is that leads up to the Mars rover that's named Perseverance that's landing on February 18th. Um, stay tuned. We're going to have a live watch party technology that we helped um, come up with and study using Great Salt Lake as an analog um, is going to be on Mars and landing there and it's really excited and we'll be totally nerding out with everybody else. Um, on February 3rd, we've partnered with Utah Humanities, the Department of Heritage and Arts for the Thrive 125, um, the, the birthday of Utah, to present um, Humanities in the Wild uh, with the Spiral Jetty. So I will be talking with um, art historian, teacher, curator, historian Hikmet Lowe, who spent her time studying Spiral Jetty, which um, should be really fun. Um, and I'm going to link to this in the comments after I'm done blabbing at you. Um, and this is just hot off the press. I wanted to show you this. This is um, a report um, from an environmental chemistry class. So we really love to work with teachers and have worked with um, a high school teacher. And this is a report that a high school kid did. 
this high school student, 32 pages with all sorts of really cool science. Um, some of the coolest ones are these um, density gradients where they colored different salinity water from Great Salt Lake to see how um, density would affect their layering. I think it's really beautiful and really cool and actually came out of a class that um, Dr. Bonnie and Dr. Joanne ran. Um, it was a salty science class at Westminster College. Um, and Karin, you know, Karin Kedenring is going to be here later talking about our wetlands. I wanted to maybe make a pitch for this young human to come work in your lab, lab someday. They actually went out and did a bunch of field testing um, at Farmington Ponds and um, are trying to understand how different environmental factors affect uh, these wetlands. I think this is really cool. And um, the reason I bring this up, and I um, hope that, that you will love this dance that this brine shrimp is doing because brine shrimp are the coolest. <laughs> And so the reason that I bring this up, um, this young student, this high school student, she talks about my favorite learning activity was growing our own brine shrimp and making up our own experiments based on what we were interested in. And she goes into, you know, the greatest threats to Great Salt Lake through this project and learning about this project about um, how the lake, um, the greatest threat is water diversion and evaporating up. And we need to be very conscious about our water use. Um, and, and so I want you to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, because the reason I'm talking about these teachers is um, this spring we're going to unveil a uh, brine shrimp in the classroom. Um, this is a, a project that we're working in collaboration with other people. And we want you to sign up if you're a teacher, or educator of any kind, we want to send you this. Um, it comes with some live algae in this cute little tube. It comes with a secchi disc that you can um, measure the turbidity or how much algae is in the water. And then of course it comes with this little bag that's full of salt and um, brine shrimp cysts. And everything can, you know, be held in this little bag. But uh, through Great Salt Lake Institute, we're building curriculum that fits the science standards for Utah um, that will fit into fifth grade. And we want to have some, um, we would like to have some teachers and students to experiment on. So I'm going to link to that webinar after in this chat um, and you can always email me and remind me i want you to sign up for that though so that we can send you kits before we do a webinar on how um, to grow brine shrimp in your classroom um, so i will link to that and now um, before we get before we get too far down the road and i start talking about brine shrimp anymore um, I want to introduce Katie Newburn. Um, Katie Newburn is the Education and Out Outreach Director for Friends of Great Salt Lake. Katie facilitates the organization's environmental education programs, which, which seek to develop the next generation of Great Salt Lake stewards and engages community members of all backgrounds through outreach. Friends of Great Salt Lake is a nonprofit membership organization founded in 1994 with the mission to preserve and protect the Great Salt Lake ecosystem through education, research, advocacy, and the arts. Um, and to learn more, become a member, visit www.fogsl.org. Um, we invited Katie to come to this event um, because we really think that um, getting out to the lake and forming a relationship is a really important part of understanding the lake and wanting to preserve it into the future. So Katie, please join us. Can everyone see my screen up here? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm sorry, did it just, did it go out of present mode just now? Nope, it's good. Okay. Sweet. Um, so thank you guys so much for inviting me to um, 
be a part of this session. I know it's a little bit of a diversion from um, plant biology of Great Salt Lake, but um, I totally agree that um, experience and education around Great Salt Lake is important for um, its continued existence, essentially. And I'm excited to share some suggestions about um, how to have a great experience at Great Salt Lake. I know a lot of us who are here already, Great Salt Lake enthusiasts, um, but this is maybe some, I hope maybe you'll consider these suggestions um, in that, with the intention of sharing Great Salt Lake with someone else in your life who uh, maybe isn't as familiar with it and who you can bring out with you on your next visit to one of these great destinations and um, help expand our network of Great Salt Lake advocates. Um, and, you know, we can all be Great Salt Lake missionaries to some degree. So um, I'm going to just share some tips for your visits and some easy destinations to get out to. Um, as Jamie said, I'm with Friends of Great Salt Lake and our mission is to preserve and protect the Great Salt Lake ecosystem through education, research, advocacy, and the arts. So we provide programs within each of those focus areas and um, my work focuses on our education programs, especially our Lakeside Learning Field Trip Program, which in an ordinary year would bring about 3,000 fourth grade students out to Great Salt Lake um, for an experiential education program. But because we weren't able to have in-person field trips throughout 2020, we focused on adapting our content from that program into resources that teachers and families can access to help them on their own visits out to the lake. So those are available at this link here. I'll share some of those resources in a little bit. Um, and I feel like experiential education at Great Salt Lake is um, not, it, we know that outdoor education is beneficial in so many ways for students and for the environment in general, for students' understanding of the natural world and their place within it. But to me, for Great Salt Lake, um, the time is really ripe for experiential education. Um, not only is it this super weird and wonderful ecosystem, it's also facing very serious existential threats. However, many of those are threats that all of us who live in communities around and upstream of the lake have the power to um, prevent or counteract. So rather than feeling really overwhelmed or defeated by the threats that Great Salt Lake is facing, I think that experiential education and just visiting and exploring Great Salt Lake um, has the power to inspire and empower all of us to know that we can all be a part of the solution instead of part of the problem. So I think um, with that in mind, um, get out and visit <laughs> if you can. And some, some basic tips for Great Salt Lake is to know your season. Um, there's lots of beautiful times of the year to go and visit. Um, one of the biggest issues that people run into, however, are the no gnats, the biting gnats, um, especially peaking in the spring. They're super abundant. They are resistant to all forms of bug spray. Um, and they will just basically <laughs> can ruin your day. So they're especially prevalent um, around Antelope Island and um, at some of the other locations that I'll share too. But this is really, they really peak between April and June and it can be, you know, a negative experience. So that's something to be mindful of. If you're going out or if you're going to bring people who are less experienced, you want them to have a positive impression and become, you know, inspired and feel enthusiastic about wanting to continue to explore Great Salt Lake and, um, feel like they want to continue to get to know it and go back and visit more. Um, in the summer, it um, gets very hot and exposed out at most destinations around the lake. Um, so that just means it's important to be extra prepared with sun protection and water. Um, and 
many people are probably familiar with the spiders that emerge, especially in August, all around the lake. And many of us have embraced the spiders. I know Great Salt Lake Institute and Friends of Great Salt Lake were both partners of the Antelope Island Spider Fest in August, which is an amazing event that seeks to help um, inform the community and the public and, um, you know, help people learn to appreciate the role that spiders play in the ecosystem. But if you're averse to spiders or someone you might want to bring out as averse to spiders, it's good to be aware and maybe choose a different season or location. Um, fall and winter are lovely, lovely times to explore Great Salt Lake. Um, this time of year right now is wonderful and it is, there's like no one out there. It's super not crowded, which is also great for the current conditions of the world. There's lots of open space and open air. Um, and I would encourage anyone to go to any of these destinations right now. Um, it's also important to, you know, be prepared for your adventure and bring all of the necessary supplies, definitely layers. There's lots of variable weather all around the lake and um, binoculars are great to have to get a closer look at some of the incredible wildlife that you can see from there. Um, sun protection, a towel is an amazing tool to have. Um, if we learned anything from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's the multiple uses of towels, not the least of which is being able to dry off um, and also keeping an open mind about what your experience might be. There might be smells, there might be bugs, there might be spiders, but if you go without having you know specific expectations, I think the lake can really speak for itself when the conditions and the preparation is right and it's it's easy to feel enamored by it. So um, with that said, I'm going to talk about a few of my favorite destinations that are super, super accessible, easy places to explore some of Great Salt Lake's different um, habitats and the ecosystems within the Great Salt Lake ecosystem. Um, one of my favorite places that's relatively new is Eccles Wildlife Education Center in Farmington. And this is a, a beautiful place to explore the Farmington Bay wetlands. There are so many migratory birds birds um, that you can observe here and they've got a mile and a half about nature trail with some um, overlooks that you can walk out to to look for pelicans and beavers and turtles all kinds of things along the trail I've seen killdeer nests right on the trail so that's something to be kind of cautious of too um, and something that I a tool that I love to use there is the Merlin bird ID app which um, you just answer these three simple questions down at the bottom of the screen and it'll come up with this list of potential birds that you may have seen just based on answering the question. So for budding fledgling birders in your lives, that's a really awesome tool to use there. And um, it's free to access, they're open, the trails are available um, any, every single day during daylight hours you can go. Um, their facilities have been, um, had, have had limited operation over the last year, but um, the trails are always open. So I'd encourage anyone to go explore there. Um, to get an experience of some saltwater and freshwater marshes, another great place is the Nature Conservancy's Great Salt Lake Shorelands Preserve. They have this beautiful wooden boardwalk that's made of uh, reclaimed railroad wood, and um, they have an audio tour in English and Spanish that you can use while you walk all around the preserve. It is just gorgeous, and um, you can see again, all kinds of bird activity. They have um, barn owls that will roost and sit in the wooden structures. And so you can look at the barn owl pellets, which are super neat. Um, lots of raptor activity, shorebirds during the spring and the fall. So again, it's free to visit. They're open um, roughly during daylight hours in the winter. And um, it's a, a, another beautiful destination to go explore. That's just really family friendly, friendly for um, all kinds of all kinds of folks. Um, Great Salt Lake State Park in Magna is one of the closest um, destinations to visit Great Salt Lake from the Salt Lake City area or anywhere south of there. Um, again, just great facilities, easy to get around. And um, if you've never 
gone to if you've never like waded in the lake been into great salt lake this is the perfect place to do it it's just super close the beach is very accessible from the parking lot and just go wade into the water look for brine shrimp um, just take in all of the expansive open water right in front of you and you can count how many islands you can see watch the sailboats go in and out of the marina um, you can even launch a kayak or a paddleboard from their public boat ramp um, and so it's a, a, just a great very easy accessible place to go catch a sunset whatever you'd like to do um, this it's currently open from 9 a.m to 5 p.m and there's a five dollar per vehicle entry fee which is well worth it and of course last but not least um, antelope island state park is just an amazing destination to go explore great salt lake it is abundant with wildlife, anything you could imagine. Um, it's just amazing to go and look at the bison, look at the pronghorn. They released bighorn sheep on the island not too long ago. And originally there were 25, I think they're up to 27 now. So um, those are what would be an amazing sight to see. Um, along the causeway, you can catch migratory shorebirds, um, just in incredible quantities during the spring and the fall. And there are so many different trails and hikes you can do. Um, you can stargaze, the Antelope Island is an international dark, dark sky park. Um, and if you would like to float in Great Salt Lake, which is quite a rite of passage, um, Bridger Bay on Antelope Island is a really good destination to do that. And they have showers um, that are accessible to rinse off afterwards too. So to help you on your visits to Great Salt Lake, um, we have some resources. We adapted our Lakeside Learning field trips to um, self-guided formats for Antelope Island State Park and Great Salt Lake State Park. So these are exactly the route and activities and content that we would um, present to our students. Um, and it's a, just a helpful way to kind of guide you on your visit around the around those locations um, and they're geared toward fourth grade but they're really adaptable to any age just depending on what you what your interests are um, and if you're not interested in following the full field trip we have also broken down some of our key activities into um, individual um, individual activities. So one of um, my favorite activities is building a watershed model um, representing Great Salt Lake as the lowest point with the mountains surrounding it and the three main rivers flowing in. We also have the lytic sand experiment, which is really fun. If you bring some vinegar out with you, you can watch it react with the um, oolitic sand on the beaches. And we also have a brine shrimp patch kit that you can request from our website as well. Um, and let's see, um, I'll just show you briefly our website here is where all of those things are located. The self-guided field trips. This is what they look like supplies, information about the parks and the different stations that we go through and the, um, individual activities are here too. There's instructions and videos as well. So um, if anyone has any questions about um, any of those destinations that I've shared or tips to help you on your visit, please let me know. We'd be happy to help give you any more recommendations or suggestions. And thank you again to the Grace Lake Institute for this amazing series and helping um, everyone in our community to learn a little more about Great Salt Lake. Thank you, Katie. Okay, here. I do have another joke. Can I tell a joke, Dave? <laughs> Are you ready? It's for you. Oh. Okay, I'm ready. Are you ready? Um, great. Um, what kind of weed is acceptable at Great Salt Lake, Dave? Pickle, Pickle weed. weed? <laughs> Pickle weed. <laughs> Want weed. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna bring. Uh, wait, wait, and you don't have to drive to Colorado for that. <laughs> no, you just have to go to the <laughs> lake. Not. All you have to do. That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry to be ridiculous. Um, so now um, <laughs> I'm gonna invite Dr. David Parrott and Amber Bradbury uh, to talk about shoreline plants of Great Salt Lake. Um, 
So Dr. Dave Parrott, oh, give me just one second here, I'm sorry. My computer is wigging out. Uh-oh. <clears throat> Okay, so Dr. David Parrott and Amber Bradbury wrote a chapter in um, Great Salt Lake Biology, A Terminal Lake in a Time of Change um, on shoreline plants. Um, Dr. Dave Parrott is interested in the interactions between plants and the microbes they share the soil with. He is specifically interested in those interactions, which might help in better understanding how plants tolerate drought or high soil salinity. As the Assistant Director of Great Salt Lake Institute, Dr. Parrott has a profound curiosity for the halophilic bacteria and fungi found in and around Great Salt Lake, and is also interested in the practical applications those microbes might lend themselves to. Dr. Parrott teaches a variety of biology classes, including cell biology, plant biology, and microbiology. He is committed to training students to not only communicate with other scientists, but to engage the public in ways that promote science learning, foster excitement and curiosity, and to inspire future scientists in the community. And um, uh, Amber, uh, was one of um, Dave's students when she was at Westminster College. Um, Amber Bradbury is a current conservation ecology master's student at University of Michigan in, in the Fufopolis. Did I get that right? The Fufopolis lab? <laughs> uh, that's hard to say. Um, and she is a recipient of uh, an award from the National Science Fin Foundation. Her thesis focuses on the ecological impacts of agricultural land abandonment through monitoring soil nutrients, plant community, and invertebrate population changes on the Greek island of Naxos. I, I, I did um, today, I um, volunteered to go do her field work for her. So in case you want that, that's good. Um, and um, really cool, I think um, she also works as a crisis advocate and birth doula and hopes to enter um, to center community outreach and so social justice throughout her career as an ecologist. Um, during her undergraduate studies in biology and chemistry at Westminster College, she worked with Dave to complete research on the history and community composi composition of Great Salt Lake shoreline plants. And um, so Ember and Dave are going to tag team this talk and um, Ember is going to start, but Dave is going to show his screen. Yeah, that work. Thank you so much. That's great. I can see it. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm Ember. I am at UMIS right now. Um, and while I was at Westminster, I, Dave is my plant biology professor. Um, and we did this chapter about shoreline plants of the Great Salt Lake. So I'll just kind of chat about how we looked into the history of botanists that examine these populations um, and then kind of like what we found. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like I said, we'll give a brief botanical history in that um, next slide. Oh. <laughs> Is mostly about Seville flowers. Who's this one guy who's really, really cool. Um, in 1934, he published this vegetation survey that was the first thing to demonstrate the biotic and abiotic factors of specifically the shoreline area. Um, so that's the area between like the terrestrial part and like the traditional kind of um, sagebrush communities that we would see. And then also in between the aquatic part um, and not including the wetland plants, which Karin will talk about later. So he was the first person to do this um, and he cataloged the plant communities, floristic characteristics, water composition and soil salinity. Uh, and we really pulled out the plant communities and floristic characteristics. And then also notably, um, they haven't changed that much since the 1934 studies. Um, and that's noted in a bunch of different reviews that we found. Next slide. Yeah, so is, there isn't that much work um, done on the shoreline area. So really what we pulled from the most were these old historic studies. Um, and I went to the Natural History Museum mostly and looked at these really cool index card catalogs and found a different um, variety of field notes and USGS mineral surveys. Um, but mostly I'd like to point out that they all cited flowers at some point. Next slide. 
So what we did to make our comprehensive key, which is kind of like the culmination of the chapter besides salt tolerance mechanisms, was we took all of Flowers' data and all of the work that was found from the NHMU um, and compared it with this data portal, SEINet, and that's a really good tool if you're an educator or a researcher, um, which is just a database of geotagged museum and citizen science specimen. And we use these coordinates if you're interested. Um, and then we compared it with Flowers' data and created this big spreadsheet. And I think it was if, um, there was more than like 32 instances in the SEI net data that we included it in the final key and kind of like most common species. Next slide. Yeah, so what we found. Right. Oh, you can go. <laughs> oh, no go, no, go ahead if you'd like. Uh, either way, but I can go very quickly. So basically, there's four different categories of things. Um, that was confirmed in Flowers' work and then also in the SEI net data. Um, and these four different categories, you can go over, Dave. All right. So the idea kind of behind this chapter was that a lot of people look at aquatic plants because Great Salt Lake is a lake. And um, I am particularly interested in how plants interact with microbes in the soil. And so it was sort of a an easy step to talk about um, the plants that grow on the shoreline, but we, we really had to sort of dig around in some historic data uh, to figure out what the shoreline actually composes or is comprised of. Um, you know, you may go out to the lake um, during non-buggy times and find that, you know, you think the shoreline was just where the water is. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, so you can break the, uh, the sort of shoreline down into sort of four distinct parts and then a part that's not quite, it's sort of a transition period or a zone between shoreline and not shoreline. Um, and so we can start where the soil is saturated with water uh, and depending on whether you're in the north or south arm, um, we call this the playa zone and the soil salinity can be upwards of 20%. Um, and that's too high for any plant to grow in. Um, typically, in the soil at least. We're not talking aquatic plants here. Um, so if we decrease the soil salinity down to around 5%-ish, uh, then you can start getting pickleweed. And we'll talk a little bit more about pickleweed. It's a really curious plant, it's very tasty. Um, you know, if you like salty stuff, I guess. And uh, uh, the one curious thing about pickleweed is it needs to germinate in fresh water and then it can tolerate in salt water. Um, Salt, soil salt level decreases in the saltgrass zone to about two and a half percent, and then decreases the further away you get from the lake. And depending on how high the lake is during, you know, abundant water times or very low times, the shoreline can shift a little bit. But like Ember said, typically the overall composition of plants along the shoreline hasn't really changed that much. It's a it's a pretty severe environment. Um, so we go from the salt uh, grass zone to the uh, shad scale green molly zone, uh, which is about one and a half percent salinity. And then it increases even more uh, into this sort of transition zone where it's about a little bit less than 1%. Uh, and this is where we get um, greasewood. And then um, greasewood then transitions into greasewood sage. And then you're basically off the actual shoreline. Um, and so these, uh, these, these different zones have been uh, categorized all the way back from flowers all the way into uh, more present day research. Um, and if you look at this map, the big white part in the center is uh, either the lake or uh, exposed lake bed. Um, and we can really talk about these four zones as they sort of circle around the lake. And so you can see the uh, pickleweed zone is about 10% clay. 10% uh, sand, silt, uh, well, it's 10% clay, sand, 10% silt, and 80% just outright clay. Saltgrass um, decreases a little bit, so we get a little bit less clay and a little bit more silt. And as we get further away from the actual lake bed, then we decrease the clay more and more. And this allows for uh, you know more normal 
you will, terrestrial plants, those, those plants that you would see growing around um, on regular type soils. So these sort of surround different pockets of uh, Great Salt Lake. So depending on where you're located and how high upslope you are from the actual lake bed, you'll see a, a difference in the actual plants. Um, and one curious thing uh, that's happening at the lake bed uh, or the, the, uh, the playa zone, or, or especially in the pickleweed zone, um, is that these plants draw a lot of minerals out of the soil. And what this does in effect is it decreases the amount of clay and increases the amount of, of sand. And this is really for the plant's benefit because what it does is it um, allows for more uh, ready water retention and availability to the roots of the plant. Um, and so we've got some studies going on about what the uh, composition of microbes is in these different kinds of soils and it does change. Uh, and so the plant is really changing its environment in order to survive. Okay, Amber, back to you. Yeah, um, so back to the plants that are there. Um, this is the full key that I made um, using a bunch of different sources. And again, these are the ones that are the most common on the shoreline area. Um, and next slide. Yeah. Uh, so like we said earlier, there's a few different distinct communities, the first of which being the pickleweed. Um, so you'll see pickleweed and then also greasewood are, is pretty prevalent. Um, and as well as, next slide please. Red swamp fire and bud sage. Um, so if you see the like really red fields that pop up sometimes, that's red swamp fire. Um, and I always think that's really interesting. Next slide. And then we have this transition to more grass communities. Um, so in the grass communities, you'll see desert salt grass, alkali sactin, um, which is sometimes even used as an ornamental, um, and drop seed. And they have a very different salt tolerance mechanism that Dave will talk about later. Um, but I do want everyone to keep in mind the kind of like harsh distinction between seeing these more succulent looking plants and then also these salt plants. I always think that's really interesting. Okay, next slide. Um, and then in the shad scale community, uh, you see more succulent kind of looking thing, shade scale, shad scale, um, as well as gray molly, which starts to transition in my mind anyway, a little bit more into that sagebrush scrub looking kind of plants. Um, but these are really common, and also really beautiful. They're kind of succulent, kind of fuzzy, kind of intricate. Um, okay, next one. And then finally, there's the greasewood community. And if you remember from earlier, greasewood is also found in the pickleweed area, um, but it starts to get more prominent as we move out towards the sagebrush area. So we'll see greasewood and iodine bush, which is my favorite plant because it kind of stacks on top of each other. And then we'll also see some peppering of the more like terrestrial little solid terrestrial plants, like I said earlier, the sagebrush area. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting cross section to look at, um, but all of these plants um, have to adapt to salty environment because um, typical soil, say in your yard, if you live in Salt Lake City or wherever you happen to live, um, there's almost no uh, salt in those soils. Plants are extremely susceptible to damage by salt, uh, either by salt uh, poisoning plants or salt, which is um, keeping water away from plant roots. And so there are a couple of different mechanisms we can talk about when we're talking about at least Great Salt Lake plants. Uh, and there are, for every species of plant that grows near Great Salt Lake or in any salty environment, there are a multitude of different mechanisms. But we'll talk about a couple um, that are really kind of interesting. So saltgrass is really cool because saltgrass um, actually will actively take up water out of the soil like all plants do. Um, but these plants don't have a way of filtering salt out. So what they have to do then is, is somehow deal with the salt that they're bringing up into their roots. And saltgrass does this in a really weird 
uh, and interesting way, it will actually pull water out of the soil um, and it will bring this into each individual cell in the, in the uh, plant. But as it is um, photosynthesizing and it's respiring and it's uh, water is evaporating, it actually uh, takes salt out of the, uh, the cells individually and pumps them out, secretes the salt crystals out through this specialized uh, mechanism. Um, they're trapped in these collector cells and those collector cells go through this uh, elaborate sort of way out to these secretion cells. And then the salt is secreted onto the surface of the leaf where it can't change the dynamic of uh, uh, water intake uh, inside the plant cell. And so uh, you can look under a microscope. Sometimes you can just rub your hand over uh, the, the leaf surface of saltgrass and taste. And it's sure enough, it's very salty. And that's not coming from uh, you know, water that, that, that might be uh, vaporized and blowing off on, onto the uh, surface itself. It's actually coming from inside the plant, secreting outside. It's really quite cool. Succulent plants have a different way of dealing with this. Um, succulent plants typically uh, are succulent. They have these bitter, big uh, membranes inside to hold a lot of water because we're talking about a lake, right? But it's a very salty lake and that water is not really accessible to these plants very, uh, very, very readily. And especially in the North Arm where the, the salt in the, in the water is extremely high, um, we find that these plants are really living in drought-like conditions. They're on the, the shores of a lake, but the water is very inaccessible to them uh, because of the soil and because of the salt. Uh, and so these succulent plants retain as much water as they can. So pickleweed is, is a succulent like iodine bush and some of these others. Um, but what pickleweed does is as it's growing, it's sequestering salt. It's, it's putting salt into what's called the central vacuole of the cell. Every plant cell has this. But pickleweed really uses this as a repository for all of this excess salt. So it filters the salt through the cellular components and dumps them into this big sack, basically, which is filled with water and a lot of salt. Uh, and then as the plant grows, these little pickles form on the, on the, on the very top of the plant. And those pickles um, in other areas of the world where they don't die off in the winter, uh, <clears throat> those will actually turn red and fall off. And that's how the plant gets rid of all of its salt. Um, here, the whole plant might die. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. The whole plant might die, um, and then regerminate again in the in the spring. But it will keep sequestering salt in this same manner. Um, so those are a couple of different ways plants deal with salt. Some of our research right now is looking at what microbes in the soil do to help. Um, alleviate this, this salt and drought problem that these shoreline plants have. Um, and if you're curious, I'll do a little plug here at the end. Um, you know, there's this fantastic book that this series is built upon. Um, Bonnie and Jamie are the editors of this book. Uh, we were lucky enough to contribute this chapter on shoreline plants. And uh, if you're curious about looking at Ember's amazing keys um, or learning a little bit more about the different kinds of mechanisms of uh, of salt tolerance in plants, um, by all means, go and uh, go and check the book out. And that's all we've got. Thank you, I'll Dave. Give it back to Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, Ember. And Ember, thank you so much. So. Um, right now, um, we, we're going to have our Great Salt Lake song, um, but, but our, our JD, our lovely JD, is running a little bit late. And so I am going to have um, Dr. Karen Kettenring get ready to present hey. her stuff. Is Karen going to sing a song? I, I hope so, but I didn't prepare her for this. And so <laughs> that would be bad news for everybody. <laughs> if you told me I could have got my fiddle out and would have played you an Irish jig because I do play the violin. However, no kidding. All right, we'll hold you to that. Okay. Um, well, I, I do um, want to take a minute to recognize um, in this chapter 
um, that Dr. Karen Kedenring wrote with her collaborators and students. Um, these are folks from Utah State University who are just doing wonderful things around Great Salt Lake. They're wetland managers, they're scientists with DEQ. Um, we're hearing from lots of um, researchers right now. And um, I just um, think it's wonderful that, that Utah State in your lab is um, doing so many great things for Great Salt Lake. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Karen, Kedden, Karen Kedenring um, is the head of Wetland Ecology and Restoration Lab in the Department of Watershed Sciences at Utah State University. She has a BA in biology from Oberlin College. She received her PhD in applied plant sciences from the University of Minnesota. Her PhD research focused on the restoration of sedges in prairie pothole wetlands. She was also a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Maryland, where she studied the invasion of Phragmites australis in Chesapeake Bay tidal wetlands. She's been a faculty member at Utah State University since 2008, and currently her research efforts focus on uh, the ecology, genetics, and management of wetland invaders. Um, to the seed ecology of native wetland plants with implications for wetland revegetation and three restoration genetics for sustainable functioning wetland restorations. So take it away, Karen. Thank you for giving us some of your time. Thank you. That was a lot. I gave you a lot of jargon there, but I'll try to avoid that in my talk. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I've been doing this all day, sharing the wrong screen. Um, so can you see the full slides? Yeah. Hopefully. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh, okay, great, because I also can't see your faces now that I have my slides up. So um, yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about invasive plants of Great Salt Lake wetlands. And as Jamie mentioned, um, I'm a professor at Utah State University. I'm in the Quinney College of Natural Resources. And I also have an appointment in the Ecology Center. And I'm going to be talking to you about um, some of our research efforts, as well as our manager scientist collaborations. And you can see some fun pictures here from over the years uh, uh, through my time at Utah State University. So I'm going to be focusing on um, some of the aspects of this book chapter in this great book that Bonnie and Jamie edited. And uh, so we were specifically in charge of invasive plants of Great Salt Lake Wetlands, chapter 13. And I'll also mention that Becca Downard and Keith Hambrick, two of my co-authors on this book chapter, are panelists tonight. So um, it will be really helpful to have their insights as well during the Q&A. So, uh, some of the other co-authors, Chad Cranny got his master's degree in my lab, but he manages Salt Creek and public shooting grounds. Becca's at Utah Division of Water Quality um, and has worked with me both. Um, I was on her committee as a master's student and she was in my lab for her PhD. Keith Hambrick has never been my student, but uh, we've collaborated a lot. He's the only non-Utah State University um, student on here. I believe he went to the U. Uh, Emily Tarsa is a PhD student with me. Diane Manu's got her master's degree in my lab, but works for Utah Geological Survey. And Christine Rohall got her PhD in my lab and now is a postdoctoral researcher at University of Florida. So just a super fun project working with all these great people. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about wetland invaders. Who are they? And what's the big deal with invasive species anyway? and what can be done without them so specifically or what can be done about them specifically focusing on great salt lake so um obviously phragmites australis or common reed gets a lot of attention and i will speak quite a bit about that this evening um, and it does it gets all the press because it's the most widespread invasive plant that we have in wetlands in utah and frankly across north america it's extremely pro problematic that's why i was working on it in maryland and when i came to utah i realized wow i've got some job security here there's a very large phragmites invasion problem um, so it also gets a lot of press because there's a lot of money being um, invested in managing this plant. 
However, um, I do want to just mention that there are a number of notable other invasive species that I'll just touch on now. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time speaking about them tonight, but I want to make you aware of some of these other plants. So purple loosestrife, Lithrum salicaria, uh, is a beautiful plant. It actually was um, part of the reason it's become invasive is because it was planted in people's gardens. One single plant can produce 2.7 million seeds, so it can really spread quite readily. A more recent invader that we featured in this book chapter is European sea heath, uh, Frankenia pulveriulenta. <laughs> Say that fast a few times. White top you might have seen um, along roadsides. Uh, Cardaria draba uh, is a noxious weed in Utah. Um, and it looks somewhat similar to perennial pepperweed, uh, Lepidium latifolium. This plant has, its roots have been found up to three meters in the soil, deep down in the soil. That's insane. Um, cattails are kind of interesting. Typha domingensis and latifolia, they're actually native here uh, to this region, but they're considered invasive. So this is um, a good time to perhaps define non-native versus invasive. Non-native means it just isn't from here, but invasive plants are plants that are aggressive and tend to take over and form huge stands. So you can see that, for instance, in that picture with perennial pepperweed, that vast expanse of that one plant. So that's considered um, invasive just because it takes over and not a lot else can persist with it. And, um, and just on a side note too with non-native species, in one recent survey, uh, 70 non-native plant species were documented in or near Great Salt Lake wetlands. So there's a lot of non-native plants out there, but not all of them become invasive or really problematic is how I like to think about it. So um, what can be, what, what is the big deal? What is lost with widespread plant invasions? Well, I think probably everybody here recognizes the importance of Great Salt Lake and Great Salt Lake wetlands as part of this vast ecosystem. And we really are, we have an oasis in the desert. This aerial photo on the bottom there shows how much brown there is in this landscape versus the green of Great Salt Lake really pops out there. And because it's a, an oasis, it supports more than 130 water bird species, either resident or migratory birds, that are moving along the Central and Pacific flyways. And it's because we have this diversity of habitats and abundant resources, um, they're just essential to fuel birds on these, uh, on these migrations. So that map on the left-hand side there, um, this really nice map that Becca put together, you can see the different colors show the different types of wetlands those playa and mudflat wetlands along the, particularly along the fringe of, um, or the shorelines of Great Salt Lake, like we were just hearing about. Um, open water wetlands and that darker blue up by the Bear River Refuge in particular and Harold Crane. Um, we've got emergent wetlands in that darker green and the pink is meadow wetlands. So really a diversity of wetland habitat types. And then of course, birds are using the lake itself as, as we all know. So again, thinking about what is lost potentially with invasive species, when we lose these habitats, we lose, we're, we're not able to support these incredible bird species. And this is just a snapshot of some of the, um, how important Great Salt Lake and its wetlands are to a wide array of bird species. As one example, American Avocet, we have some of the highest counts of this bird in the world at 250,000 black neck stilts. We again have some of the highest counts in the world at 65,000. Marble godwits uh, shown there in that D panel. We have the only interior staging area for this species in the west, Western North America. Snowy plovers, these beautiful, delicate uh, little birds. Cinnamon teals, green winged teals. This habitat is essential for them. Moving around on the, up, on the other side, redheads, northern shovelers, again, providing essential habitat. Uh, tundra swans, we have 75% of the Western population staging and fueling uh, along Great Salt Lake during the fall migration. 
and Wilson, Wilson's fowler, we have the largest staging population. So I'm not a bird um, person, but uh, I just find these this diversity of species just striking. And so the concerns are, again, as we're losing habitat, that uh, we're really impacting at a continental scale, these different bird species. And I also just want to note that these photos were taken by Mia McPherson um, from On the Wing Photography. She was gracious enough to allow us to use these photos in our book chapter. So they're really, she's an amazing photographer. So in addition to bird impacts directly, we need to also consider the economic and cultural impacts of invasive plants. And just a few examples here. We know that bird watching and other non-consumptive uses are, well, one, important for our well-being, our livelihoods, but also um, have economic contributions in, um, locally to the Salt Lake City economy. There's one study that uh, that estimated that $50 million annually uh, resulted from these non-consumptive uses of these wetlands and the lake. Uh, there's also really important cultural events like the Great Salt Lake Bird Festival, as, may, as some of you may, may have attended. And then, of course, waterfowl hunting is, is a part of our culture and um, a part of our history and um, contributes $100 million annually to our economy. So with that, um, I want you to also be thinking about plants, what plants are lost. So I talked about the fact that millions of birds are visiting these Great Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake and associated wetlands each year. And they're dependent on these unique habitats for food, nesting, shelter, loafing, brood rearing, and so forth. So we're losing plant communities, brackish emergent wetlands, playas, meadows, fresh open water areas because, um, and these native plants that dominate there. So I have um, just some common names of these plant species. I noticed in one of the Q and A, somebody was asking for Latin names, and I'm happy to share that at a later. Uh, a later point, it's all in the book chapter, but some of the key species are hard stem bulrush, three square and alkali bulrush on that top panel there, salt grass and pickleweed, and sago pond weed, that's a submerged uh, species, uh, mountain rush in panel G there, and on the bottom row there, moving left to right, common spike rush, nodding bigger tick, and rayless alkali aster, fringed willow herb, some really important species for, um, for our native habitats and restoration. So with that, um, Jamie, is there an issue with uh, the slides I see in the Q&A there? You know, I'm not sure. I can see everything good. Are other people having trouble seeing the entire screen? This is Bonnie. I, I'm not having any trouble, but I don't know if anyone out there, if you could put in the chat box, if you are having trouble, it looked like Cindy was having trouble. Huh. Cindy Can can't see all slides, but I don't know if no means no problems or no means it's not working. No problems, says Preston or Margie. Or Rosalie, okay. Okay, Rosalie, Margie has no problems, so Rosalie. Lynn, um, Cindy, Lynn says choose to fit window under view options. Oh. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna keep going good. here if we're good to go. Yeah, thank you. No, it looks fine on your end, um, but maybe if viewers are having trouble, they can um, listen to Lynn's um, response, choose to fit window under okay. view options. Maybe they, they need to select a different view option. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I want to um, get back to our main attraction and talk about Phragmites largely because this is where a lot of our research efforts has, have been. So um, a little background about Phragmites in Utah. This plant was introduced from Eurasia, and as I mentioned earlier, it's found throughout much of North America in wetlands and disturbed habitats. And uh, well, it's a very aggressive plant. You can see, so there's Chad Cranny. He is not a short person. He is quite tall at six and a half feet tall and this plant is towering above him. You can see the track from the Marshmaster there and you can see just the sheer amount of biomass. But interestingly, Phragmites is a cryptic invader. There is a native subspecies. Um, it's not found really along Great Salt Lake now at all. There's one spot along Utah Lake where I know it has been in the past. 
um, but it's in more remote areas in, uh, in southern Utah in particular. So back to non-native invasive Phragmites. The first record of it was in 1993 in the in herbarium records, but it probably was around since the 80s based on conversations I've had with a number of people. Um, and how much do we have? Well, one estimate in 2011 from work by my student Lexine, we estimated we had about 93 square kilometers on Great Salt Lake. Um, uh, it's not clear exactly how much we have now. We still have a lot. Um, Conveniently, though, Utah Department of Ag and Food classified it as a class three containment species in terms of noxious weeds. So there is some additional funding for controlling it and um, uh, legal motivation for that. Nonetheless, we're still spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on control. Uh, but I must say that DWR and Forestry Fire State Lands and many of the other managers have made incredible progress in terms of controlling the species. So what specifically is the problem with Phragmites? It is, again, poor habitat. It crowds out other native plants. As you saw, just how dense it gets. It's physically impossible to move through. And it's replacing um, native species that are important food sources. In that picture on the lower left, you can see salt grass and alkali bulrush seeds. And those are two important species, uh, food source species. In addition, it impedes recreation and views and site access. So here's a picture from near Saratoga Springs and some folks thought that they bought lakes, uh, lakefront property, yet they cannot get to the lake because that is all solid Phragmites. Um, so, and you know, that's Utah Lake, but um, it's a similar issue in other parts of uh, North America. So not only a problem for wildlife, but also for people. And uh, related to that, it really is a fire hazard and a impact, potential impact to air quality. There have been a number of um, arcs and wildfires where the fire just escapes and, um, you know, hundreds of acres are burned. And that's, we do use burning for controlling Phragmites, um, but uh, often that's done when the air quality that they have great restrictions on when that can happen to ensure that um, we don't negatively impact air quality. It's also a thirsty plant. We obviously live in a dry place. And so because it is so prolific and produces so much biomass, it's transpiring a lot of water. So there's concerns about those impacts. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how it spreads. So um, when I'm going to be transitioning here to talk about some of the research we've done since I started at Utah State in 2008. One of the first things we wanted to figure out is what are the mechanisms of its spread? We know that it can spread by seeds. You can see those pictures on the upper right um, in the four panel there on the left hand side of that four, four picture panel. And on the right hand side of that panel, you can see spread by stolons, which are stems above ground as well as rhizomes, which are stems below ground. But we did some genetic work early on to figure out what the relative contribution was of spread by seeds versus spread asexually by rhizomes and stolons. And our work showed that actually most of the spread is by seeds. It's really spreading far and wide. And that really had implications for how people approach uh, management. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so, I just want, I, just to, in terms of thinking about numbers, one thing I want you to be thinking about is one inflorescence, those flower heads can produce somewhere between 1,500 to 3,000 seeds, just one single flower head. So if you look at that picture in the lower right there, where there are tens of thousands of um, flowering heads, you can imagine that this plant has what we call um, very high propagule pressure, propagules being those seeds just the amount of seeds blanketing the landscape is really astronomical. So let's talk about what can be done about it um, in terms of management and the role of my research group. So um, as when I started my research program at Utah State, I wanted to get a sense of what managers needs were and initiate collaborations. So this is my scientific perspective on things. We had questions about how is Phragmites currently managed? What are the big questions that managers had? Uh, again, this is back in 2008, 2009. How do they approach revegetation, <coughs> seeding and planting? 
And how can we facilitate collaborations between scientists and managers? So one of the things that we did early on to address these questions was to survey wetland managers. So you can see our not super fancy survey on the right hand side there. Things have come a long way in the last 12 years. Um, and some of the things that we found from our early surveys were that the most common way that people were controlling Phragmites was spraying it in the fall with glyphosate. It's the same chemical that's in um, Roundup that people use in their garden sometimes, um, but a wetland formulation. But there are questions about the best time to be spraying it, whether this other chemical, imazapir, was better, could cows be used to graze it, and um, we also were noting that people were not really revegetating, seeding, or planting. Um, and there were questions about whether that was needed and how to do that. So that really helped set our agenda. Um, and uh, the other thing was that we also starting, um, so we want to address these research questions. And we did so by initiating collaborations with many managers. So you can see some of the pictures. Um, some of the folks there, for those of you that have worked on Great Salt Lake, you may recognize a num number of people, particularly in the upper right, that have since retired. So um, this was a while ago, but through the development of these Phragmites management studies, we initiated these collaborations that are still going on today. And some of the key outcomes of really intentionally working with managers from the start is that there is much improved communication among all of us. Um, and we've been able, from our standpoint, it's been fantastic to be able to collaborate for many large scale joint studies where we're doing, we're looking at how to treat invasive plants at very large scales and figuring out what's most cost effective. And we're looking at treatments that managers might actually implement as opposed to, you know, in academia, we sometimes um, uh, I just saw the comment from Valerie. <laughs> yes, Valerie's in that top photo from back in the day. Um, we looked at treatments that were very straight, generally straightforward to implement as opposed to, you know, when you leave scientists to their own devices, we kind of scheme up things that maybe are not super realistic to implement on the ground. So um, we embarked on a series of large scale uh, management studies, and this, this was the research of Chad Cranny when he was a master's student, and Christine Rohal when she was a PhD researcher um, in my lab. And we looked at things like the best timing and type of herbicide, how to stop that seed production that I mentioned, and it was really a massive five-year effort that uh, it just, it was fantastic. It was great. Uh, we learned a lot and um, it, was, it was just a great collaboration. So what exactly did we find, the answers to those questions? So um, before I jump into the key findings, I'll note that we've summarized this work in this document, How to Restore Phragmites, uh, Invaded Wetlands. And this is an extension document that is free and easily available. Uh, but some of the key findings were um, confirming that this fall application that managers had already been doing for a while was better than a summer application of herbicide. So um, on the East Coast, a lot of people were thinking that summer applications might be better. And there were questions here, too, about the fact that uh, later in the fall, many of our wetlands, may be, our plants may be drought stressed so that herbicide might not work super well. Um, this chemical amazapir that again was emerging on the East Coast is really very effective. Turned out it was not greatly superior to glyphosate and it's amazapir is a lot more expensive. So there's generally, in most cases, not a reason to be using it. And we also were able to show that it's important in that first year, if you can get rid of the seeds, those millions and millions of seeds through mowing or grazing, that you can be much more effective in the long term. Um, optimizing frag management. So what's the long-term prognosis? And, you know, not all management treatments will work across all sites. And what about with patches that are small and contained, like in that picture there, versus vast expanses? Um, let's, uh, so some of the key findings from our research were that 
there is for sure going to be, th this plant is not going anywhere. So thinking about budgeting and effectiveness, long-term control, keeping after those small patches that pop up in the landscape is going to be essential. We did also find that some of the sites that went more dry, became more dry in the fall, the herbicide basically, you need to have healthy Phragmites to be able to kill it with herbicide. If it's drought stressed, it doesn't take up the herbicide. Um, we also found that native plants, um, it was, they were generally coming back pretty slowly and quite variably, particularly in those drier sites. Uh, and it really depends on what kind of plants are around the area. You know, again, in this picture here, you can see that Phragmites stand, but it's surrounded by a sea of alkali bulrush. So those are places where you'd have more success. Um, in addition to that, uh, we also looked at grazing. And, um, you know, we're here in Utah, there are a lot of cows, and there were questions about could we use grazing effectively? Um, but, you know, cows poop in wetlands, is that a good thing? What might be those water quality impacts? So we embarked on, again, another massive effort. This was Brittany Duncan's master's research. She now works for Utah Department of Ag and Food. Um, and we had these 30 acre research plots across multiple sites at Harold Crane and Howard Slough and Farmington Bay. Um, and this picture on the lower right, I think Becca Danner took this um, picture and uh, you can see the impact of grazing. So the square, the kind of square rectangle um, perimeter there is actually the fence line. And outside of it, the no treatment area, there's no cattle, but on the inside, you can see where the cattle had have lots of paths through the Phragmites and how they're basically breaking down the biomass. So what did we fi find from this research that Brittany did? Uh, we saw that grazing really was showing a lot of desirable outcomes. It's reducing the cover of Phragmites, reducing that biomass, reducing that seed production. And one thing I didn't talk about earlier, but I should have mentioned is that even when it dies off, it leaves what we call litter, lots of dead plant material. I mean, it could be waist high, it could, and, it, and it just is, again, impenetrable. Impen so cattle moving through a site can help trample it. We, um, in, from Brittany's research, we found that high intensity grazing for shorter periods of time is really important. You do need to mow some paths for the cattle to just get some access uh, and obviously, they, it would only be during the growing season. They need to be eating, eating live Phragmites. They're not going to go after dead Phragmites. There are some serious logistical challenges, though. You need to keep those cows contained, so having fencing up, um, and they need something to drink. One thing that I found that was kind of inter interesting and um, somewhat amusing was not all cows can graze in wetlands. So if you bring mountain cows down in the wetlands, their feet rot. You need to have marsh capable animals, um, which many of the managers had found, um, fa discovered this through years of working with some of these grazers. The, I think one of the most important things that Brittany found was that if you draw down your site before you graze and you don't reflood it for at least a couple weeks after the cattle are taken off, the nutrients actually stay within the site and get taken up by the plants that are growing. So we were really concerned about downstream impacts of grazing, but with the short-term high intensity grazing and, and lowering water levels, um, we were able to keep the nutrient effects, um, or basically limit any sort of negative nutrient effects. Uh, again, we summarized some of this research in this extension document, which is free, um, and I can post some links for this later. So I just want to summarize from the work from these various students what we have found and where we're headed. Um, and so we have outlined these different um, treatment cycles, so to speak. On the left-hand side, one option is that to, to go after that seed production is to first go in and mow or graze to prevent those seeds from being produced. And then come through and spray with herbicide at least a month after mowing or grazing and doing this for at least three years and then still spot spraying as DWR and Forestry Fire State Lands have been doing, um, you know, for years. They know this, uh, that they're, they're uh, demonstrating it for all how important it is. 
An alternative strategy is to spray in the fall and come through and mow or um, burn the biomass in the winter time, at least a month after spraying. And again, re, um, doing this for at least three years. At the bottom there, I say restore native plants. So one of the key findings, which I didn't have much time to talk about today, was that native plants are not coming back very uh, vigorously. And so this is actually where a lot of our research is right now to how to jumpstart this ecosystem to get it back to that important habitat through seeding or planting. The other thing that uh, really was extremely important was how working together across this whole ecosystem was so essential and being um, coordinating management. And we saw a lot of, we see a lot of great cooperation among landowners. And I say diverse landowners, this map on the right hand side, those different colors show the different types of wetlands, federal, nonprofit, private, state wetlands. And it really requires shared goals around invasive phragmites, open lines of communication and commitment to action. And it's been really inspiring to see um, all that folks have been doing for more than 10 years as you know, for 15 or 20 years now. Um, collaborating together. And part of it is because if Phragmites, if your neighbors are not doing their part with that seed production, you're not going to be able to control Phragmites because it's just spreading around so much by seed. So uh, with that, I would just like to say um, thanks to all the fantastic people in the Great Salt Lake and Great Salt Lake wetland community who've made all of this research possible and the fun collaborations that we've had over the years. And uh, I will um, be happy to take any questions with my other panelists here. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. I do have a question really quick. Have, yeah. have, have you ridden in one of those machines that cuts down all of the Phragmites? I have, yes, it's pretty fun. <laughs> Keith gets to do that all the time. <laughs> I know, it always feels like they're so high up or I don't know, what does it feel like riding in it? Is it really rough? Is it? It's uh, it's very rough, um, but it is kind of empowering. It's pretty much a, a tank, <laughs> a wetland tank. I found it very dizzying too. Those That picture I showed early on of Chad um, standing next to that really tall Phragmite. So we'd just driven through it and you literally could not see, you had no idea where you were. It was just a sea of Phragmites and it kind of, you're pounding it down with the machine as you're driving and it it's hypnotic slash nauseating. <laughs> if it's a if it's a cloudy day and you can't see the mountains, you have no idea where you are. Um, so we we'll have to guide ourselves with imagery on on our phones when we're driving through it. Jeez, but it's on my bucket list. I need to trick somebody into letting me have <laughs> one of those things. <laughs> if you have any seasonal allergies, take a lot of drugs before you go out. Like driving into the middle of a stand of Phragmites is, it is really cool and horrifying. I have terrible <laughs> pollen allergies, <laughs> but it's super fun. And the, the state actually, in non-COVID years, they take a lot of volunteers to go yeah. out and help them spray. So you could be part of that. Yeah, cool. Hey, well, before we go to our question session, I want to invite a very special student. He was a Great Salt Lake student. If he'll, um, JD, if you'll unmute yourself and put your video on and I'm gonna spotlight you if, if you'll quit moving. Hi, JD. Hi. Hey, Bonnie. Oh, you. yay, JD. So JD, sometimes we have favorite students and all of our students are favorite students, but JD really is um, uh, one of those people that taught me a lot when I was there. I want to show you um, this picture was taken. <laughs> uh, I think it was at graduation, like maybe it was. That's, it a, was... that's my Tinder profile pic. <laughs> yeah, right. That's my, uh, yeah. That's in my lab. I love it. Yeah. So he's in the lab and, and you were doing, I think your senior, um, some kind of like a senior composition, something or other. And, um, we took this picture. And so I want to introduce JD. I'm going to stop. Uh, Carissa says, hi, JD. Hi guys. Hi, Carissa. Oh, Carissa. <laughs> um, I'm going to, 
I'm gonna post a link to like a band that I've been playing with and recording with. And um, I guess, uh, so and like- Can I'll, I tell them about you? Do you want me to read your bio? Uh, yeah, sure. 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 So JD, JD Riard is a San Diego transplant and lifelong musician. He graduated from Westminster in 2015 and went to work in an R&D lab at a local biotech company. Since then, JD has established himself as a performing musician and music educator in the greater Salt Lake area. Um, he performs at the Tabernacle Piano Bar as well as in many original music projects around the city. And um, we convinced him to, we tricked him, maybe we tricked him is a better way to put it, into um, joining us and helping us write a song about Great Salt Lake. Well, and this song was for our 10th anniversary of Great Salt Lake Institute, which is like three years ago now, JD. Um, and we, uh, we wrote this song in my basement. Uh, Jamie and I and JD together wrote this song. Um, but he's the musical genius. We just came up with words and he put it to music. So it's really your song, JD. Oh, it's, it's for everyone. I think you guys will like this. Okay. Well, since we all love Great Salt Lake so much, this is a little song we wrote about it. history so much more just how many mysteries remain we've got lots of bugs and stinky smells the remnants of lake bonneville that is what the lake meant to me then one day i spent some time from the lake i realized what a wondrous hub of life it could be it is so enormous, nonconformist, still it continues to inform us about just how little we know. We've got mice and shrikes, no sea and bites. What the hell is a microbial light? Come with me and soon you will find. There are waters that, waters rich with brine shrimp poo, or excuse me, waters rich with brine shrimp. Out here you couldn't find a whip in existing in this harsh environment. Five million grebes, they come to gorge. The others around the shore, they forage. For shrimp, shrimp, and flies, they derive their nourishment. Well, come with me, as you will see. Great Salt Lake's for you and me. Please allow one moment to explain. Birds galore in salty shores. Utah's history, so much more. Just how many mysteries remain. Probes resisting UV radiation, heavy, met heavy metals, they cause mutation, yet birds continue their migration. Brine shrimp have two penises. Do you know what a dunaliel is? The most prominent species of algae in the lake. Well, come with me and you will see great salt lakes for you and me. Please allow a moment to explain. Birds galore in salty shores, Utah's history so much more, just how many mysteries remain. Oolites are just bright shrimp poo, washed ashore just like they do, covered in calcium, ca covered in calcium carbonate. Pelicans live on an island, mostly on gunnison in silence, unless we divert the water away. Come with me and you will see Great Salt Lake's for you and me. Please, please allow one moment to explain. Birds galore and salty shore. Utah's history so much more. Just how many mysteries remain. The spiral jetty, it's so unique. Robert Smith said he was a freak. It's a state symbol just like seagull lilies. The salt flats aren't disappearing. The great salt air was once endearing. 
Bison on antelope, we're here to stay. We've got so many places like this in the world. Wisdom we gain from them's a pearl. If we wait, I'm sure you can extrapolate. I know I'm preaching to the choir. We all know that the earth's on fire. In Great Salt Lake, it might evaporate. Well, come with me and you will see Great Salt Lake's for you and me. Please allow a moment to explain. Utah's history is so much more. Thank you guys and happy inauguration day. I know yeah. it was political, but I know we're all stoked about that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Woo, woo. <laughs> the song never gets old. I'm I mean, I might be biased, but it never gets old. Yeah, we've got no we've kidding. got more never verses. Kidding. We've got more verses in the works. So I just want to thank Bonnie and Jamie, you know, for everything that they do. And thanks for all the panelists. And thanks guys for having me so much. Seriously. Oh yeah, everybody wants you to publish that song. Come on, we need to make it downloadable. <laughs> It'll happen. I promise. I promise. <laughs> All right, we're up for it. We're up for it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. So maybe now we can start answering questions now that we um, have have that would be a silly song. Um, <laughs> there we go. So. Dave, this is for Dr. Dave Parrott and Ember. Um, what, where does the name iodine bush come from? Do you know? Um, Ember, do you have a? No, I read about it. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's actually when you crush it, it had some kind of yellow fluid that came out of it and they thought it was iodine. Oh. It's not. OK. Because I know it grows in like alkaline flats and that sort of iodiney sort of, but huh. Yeah, Learn something new every day. And, right on. And maybe this is not here nor there, but I have nightmares of editing the index because of all of the plant names that these two chapters <laughs> put us through. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Okay. I'm sorry. Of, sorry. Welcome to botany. A lot of scientific <laughs> names, yeah. Oh Between this and the birds, I tell you, we had to like, uh, yeah, and bird people like uh, make the common names lowercase versus plant people. Anyway, oh. it was, yeah, the day we went through that, Jamie and I may have had too much to drink. <laughs> the index was the worst part. Oh, it was so bad. Um, Kurt wants to know to what degree are the common plants that you identified in the key are natives and which are invasives? And that question came um, while Dr. Dave Parrott was talking. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about that? Um, I think that might have been clarified a bit by Karin's talk. So like I said in the beginning that like Seville flowers 1934 survey um, was pretty comprehensive with what we're seeing on the shoreline that's non-invasive now. Um, and of course we have like Phragmites which kind of just go everywhere. <laughs> um, and a few different ones that she mentioned. But I think for the most part, um, most of the like pickle weed, salt grass kind of things are, are native and they support the birds and different ecosystem functions of the lake. And if they're, I would say if they're if they're not native, because you know um, when we were in Romania, you see pickleweed growing there. There is a there is a native um, pickleweed, a native Salicornia, Salicornia utaensis, um, and so it's distinctly different, um, at least on the genetic level, from other pickleweeds. But um, if they're not if they're non-native, they aren't necessarily invasive. Um, and I, I think Karn, you know, really like hammered this home, which is, which is good because um, we weren't necessarily looking at native and non-native um, and we weren't necessarily looking at invasive versus non-invasive. Uh, non um, but I would say just, just um, a quick commentary, uh, the closer you get to the actual water, 
so the increase in salt really prevents almost anything but the hardiest uh, halophiles, those or halophytes, those salt loving plants. Um, it really prevents almost anything else from growing. And so if the lake is actually going to be shrinking due to water diversion and, and climate change, um, the shoreline will eventually creep up to, you know, onto the salt flats. If we can't get rid of the salt that's in the soil, then, you know, you're going to have a lot of pickleweed out there. Um, but you'll never have, you know, orchards and things like that. So it's all, you know, it, it's like, what is a weed? A weed is just a plant that's growing in a place where you don't want it, kind of. And so I would say that's that's sort of, I don't know. Karn, we'll follow you know, up on this too. Yeah, you you invasive plant people are, are way more versed in this than I am, so. Yeah, so the, the plants that they had in their basic, the, the five zones, those were all native. Um, the one that we are seeing creep into the shoreline zone is Frankenia pulverulenta. And um, like Ella at Gilmore Sanctuary is pretty high on this. But like they've said, like having a lot of salt in the soils really does prevent a lot of invaders from, from being able to get there. We do have a lot of, on the upland side, a lot of invaders, a lot of the species that Karin highlighted are upland invaders, but some pretty badass plants that are able to actually live on the shoreline. So they, they find others out pretty well. I've, I've, got a, I've got a quick question about that since Phragmite is such a big deal. How salt tolerant is it? Moderately. Um, one of the things that is interesting about it is that um, particularly as a seedling, it's not nearly as salt tolerant. So it kind of needs a fresher water pulse. But then once it's established, it just, it can, it basically subsidizes itself um, across those rhizomes and stolons. And so okay. this is the other reason why you see it actually spread into deeper water habitat as well. It'll get established in that emergent zone and then spread a little bit deeper because it basically is sending oxygen down to those deeper water areas from the upland areas. Uh -huh. So... And it's my understanding yeah. too that part of the problem, and maybe you talked about this and I didn't pay attention or I didn't quite get it, but was the dynamic nature of Great Salt Lake and that salt water like inundating some of these areas that weren't as salt tolerant and that kind of prevented this invasion. Is that is that true? Is that if you if you look at um aerial imagery of Great Salt Lake and you see all the fresh water flows. It's just constant fresh water flow and with the lake shore receded so far for so long, um, you can see these massive expanses of Phragmites growing out onto that lake bed. Um, and it's just it's only being fed by the upstream fresh water and um, it's not connected to the lake anymore. Um, so it, it's has more room to grow now with the lake so low. And if the salt water would come up, it would kill some of that stuff off and kind of control it? Depending on timing, if it stayed up really long. Interesting. Yeah, that's one of the things they bring up in kind of older management documents is the role of these catastrophic hypersailing floodwaters just kind of having a restart on all the vegetation there. Um, I have a question from Kurt. Um, as Lake Bonneville retreated, um, having a ground community of plants for thousands of years, new plants came down from the foot, foothills to colonize. Um, I understand as a result of that stress, many plants near the shoreline have two, four, six, eight, or even 12 sets of chromosomes. Um, for plants that have multiple sets of chromosomes, is there an increasing trend of duplicate chromosomes that correlates to the salinity of the soil? That's, that's kind of interesting. Um, Bonnie and I were having a back channel conversation about this. Um, typically, polyploid plants, bleh, it's a tongue twister. Um, typically, you see polyploids actually having an advantage in uh, biotic and abiotic stress. 
Um, so they are better capable for a number of different reasons. They're better capable of um, surviving. And so I suppose you could say that that these plants that have that are, that are polyploid, um, it may or may not be a direct result of being exposed to salt. That's more of an evolutionary sort of thing, which would be a bigger time scale probably. Um, but polyploid plants in general can be more salt tolerant. They can be more stress tolerant in general. Um, and I am not, I, I haven't looked at ploidy level of any of these, uh, of any of these shoreline plants, but now I'm like super curious about it. So um, th there is something to that, yes. Um, and I think that, I guess in general, we could say that, uh, again, if the lake is getting s smaller and uh, if we get rain or snow anytime soon, um, that can leach salt out of the uh, top layers of the soil and it makes that, that lake uh, shoreline, it, it sort of increases the shoreline uh, that non-salt tolerant plants can live in. And so you would expect until you get to like really, really, really hardcore uh, salty soils, you would expect that there would be a sort of encroachment. Um, but we're also dealing with, you know, drought too. So the lake dries up, we don't really have that much water coming, we don't have much rain. And so we aren't flushing the soils out. And so we're sort of at a, a situation where we're going to get like salt flatsy kinds of things. And then those plants that can tolerate soil will grow in, in the saltiest parts of the soil that they can. So we may see an increase in ploidy level, but now I really want to check it out. So now it's, it's a kind of an answer, but it's also like something that's like super interesting to me. So thank you for bringing that up. Do Rebecca, uh, Keith, and Karin have any more to add with that? Do you know anything about polyploidy and phragmites? Um, I was just going to add um, that Dave is talking a lot about the soil salinity. Um, and with these freshwater flows coming out, and phragmites has such a thick rhizome mat, um, there's areas where it's, it's almost like a floating garden of phragmites. So, it, it'll, it'll continue to grow out and maybe it's not, you know, getting its feet into the, the salty soil that it doesn't like so much, but it's being fed by fresh water and it's maintaining um, above. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Um, it, it leads to some questions about the, the um, herbicides. Have you noticed any changes in downstream effects um, with the, um, how do you say it, glyph glyphosate and in the insects, animals, and birds? Glyphosate, yeah. Glyphosate. Thank you. Yeah, this is a challenging topic, and I, um, I can't, I am not an expert on it for sure. Um, I will say there uh, was a recent study where somebody looked at Phragmite um, oak spray, basically a glyphosate, and what were impacts beyond actual spray of Phragmites. Um, and they did not detect levels in the open water next to the Phragmite stands. This was a study done in, uh, I think, in Ontario. Um, it's supposed to be a herbicide that breaks down very rapidly. And um, that's partly why we were excited that it was more effective than the alternative, alternative amazapir, which is the other herbicide that's approved for use um, in or near wetlands, because that herbicide is much more long lived, supposedly degrades much um, more slowly. So my goal really here is recognizing that there are very few tools for controlling Phragmites and if herbicide is the most effective, I mean, it's really the only thing that will kill it. Burning it doesn't kill it. It just grows back. Mowing it doesn't kill it. It just comes back just like your lawn. So um, in my, my hope and my intention with our research is to figure out how to use that herbicide in the most efficient manner so that we're not over spraying, you know, spraying more than we need to. Uh, in terms of downstream effects for invertebrates, though, um, I, I don't think anybody's looked at that at all. Uh, one of the challenges that we've run into at the Division of Water Quality is that there's a lot of chemicals 
being sprayed out on the lake. So there's the herbicide and then there's mosquito abatement and then macro invertebrate communities um, hatch really fast and die off. So trying to catch that signal of what chemical is responsible for this is that the water level has been really challenging. From, from an ac acute toxicity standpoint, um, glyphosate is very non-toxic, so it wouldn't, there wouldn't be any short-term impacts that would be observed. Um, I think it's, it's um, LD50, so it's, it's lethal dose. Um, is it's less toxic than table salt. So um, in, in like the long-term chronic impacts, um, I think really difficult to study as, as Becca was saying. And what about Frankenia? Should, this is from Lynn. Um, should we be worrying about that? Um, you know, I know it's kind of new and <laughs> um, Ella Sorensen and Heidi Hoven have both <laughs> have showed a lot of people Frankenia. What do you think about that? Becca, can you do that one? Yeah. <laughs> you know more about it than I do. Uh, listen to Ella and Heidi on this. If you have the resources to address multiple invasive species, um, one of the things about Frankenia is that it changes the albedo of the soil. So you think of kind of our salt crusted playas are super, super reflective. And then you add Frankenia and uh, pickleweed is basically the only other thing that are growing out on these places. So when you disrupt that albedo, you're disrupting the evapotranspiration that's happening there. Um, one of the big challenges, and Keith can speak to this even more, is um, we have managers in charge of really large areas. So where you can put your, your resources really matters. Um, from my experience working around Great Salt Lake, if you are bringing cattle in, they seem to be spreading things. So, you know, the fencing that Karen discussed, like, keeping the, the cattle in where you want them should help um, in preventing the spread of this because there's not a lot else that actually gets out on our playas. I have a question from Annaville. Hi, Ann. Um, it seems like both speakers classified the plants in, cer in um, certain areas. What are the differences and similarities and why are there so many maps of wetland types for Great Salt Lake? Anybody want to tackle that one? I can take first crack. <laughs> um, so I was looking at kind of the overlap that we have between like my plant book and their plant chapter. And some of the zones that they talked about in the shoreline, just they're not wetland types. So they wouldn't be classified in what Karen and I talked about, but like their playa zone and their greasewood zone are these general um, wetland zones that have been around for a long time. So it's kind of, I think it's an issue of scale if you're looking at like a managed complex versus this whole elevation gradient along Great Salt Lake. That's where the differences come in. But there is definitely a lot of overlap in, in the species we find in the wetlands and on the shoreline. Yeah, I think too, it's about, you know, when we talk about these communities, it's kind of helpful to visualize them in succession. But when you really get down to the lake, I mean, the plants aren't like, okay, we can only go in these four types and it has to be in this order. Um, and so I think too, because we took a lot of historical data, um, there might be some kind of abstraction. And, and like Becca said, with elevation change and community change invasives, you know, we're gonna see some differences. And I, that leads into kind of this last point and or question that Lynn Bose has about some of the first plant collections were from the Stansbury expedition in the mid 1800s. Um, and some of them are named for Stansbury. I know you talk about Seville flowers a lot because we didn't know much about him before that. Yeah, I saw that. Um study thing that he did survey um, yeah, yeah. Um, in the collection it was really interesting and like very old looking and very crinkly um, and 
I think we ended up using the Seville flowers one more because it was so succinct and also like was the first one to really um, categorize everything that we needed. But yeah, definitely there has been work done for a long time and the like that's really substantial. Yeah, the flowers document has become useful in, in things that I've done for the state too. Like he was, he covered you know, from the south end of the lake all the way to the north end into the wetlands. So even though it is 90 years old, it was really comprehensive. Yeah, I think it's something to consider, you know, everybody that has come to this region, you know, the greater Great Basin has looked at all of these different plants over the course of, you know, sort of more recent human history. And so we, we sort of build on each one of these, but people who are coming in like Stansbury Expedition really, you know, sort of set the stage, but we've had all these people who have been interested. And I say all these people, but I think all of us would agree that there's haven't really been that many people who have done these big surveys of this area, which makes it, again, there's this, this extra layer of uniqueness that, that this area has got because it's got interesting plants that we don't find in too many different places, but this environment that is just really unique. Um, and we just haven't had a lot of people. I was like super surprised when I started working at Westminster and was sort of thinking about what I was going to do. Like there isn't like every single thing documented down to the, you know, to the, you know, like Ember was saying, you know, everything grows in a particular location in a particular way. There isn't really that much information out there. And so flowers really was, was sort of the he's sort of the the keystone, I guess for you know for uh, flora in this, um, and I mean, what a great name. How could you how could you not be a botanist with a name like Seville Flowers? I mean, come on. <laughs> I have a really great question from Wally Gwynn. I'm glad you're here, Wally. Um, Wally wants to know um, if we can do a summary post with websites for all of these various subjects. So I know we've thrown lots of um, links into the chat and I do have a record of that Wally and I will definitely send out a document. Um, once, I, once I post all of the recording, I'll send a document with all of those links out. It's a really great idea. Thank you. And if nobody else, I don't see any more questions. And I guess I would just like to end. I um, would really like to amplify what Dr. Karan talked about, um, these positive points of communication that are happening now that um, over the past 20 years of me working out at Great Salt Lake have seen um, so much more collaboration and communication and, and really um, working towards a common goal of um, conserving Great Salt Lake uh, for the future. And so um, I really have a lot of, of hope with all of these fine humans that we see on this panel and who are young students that are going to graduate school and graduating and coming to manage our natural resources. And so um, I just want to say thanks again to all of our panelists for coming. It's really good to see your faces and hear all of the amazing things that, that everybody's doing. So thank you. Um, our next panel, our, our next Salty Science Seminar is next week. Um, it's going to be all about Great Salt Lake and Mars and the, the tar seeps. We wrote a chapter about the tar seeps that are in the north arm of Great Salt Lake and entrap animals. So um, uh, am I on Mars or Great Salt Lake? Because a lot of times Mars is kind of like being on another planet. So thank you for coming. Thank you for caring about Great Salt Lake. Um, we will check you out next week um, and, and have an awesome week. <laughs>